our third presenter for today's symposium, Dr. Ian Miller. He will be discussing his topic on genetics of epilepsy. Dr. Miller joined the Nicklaus Children's Brain Institute in July of 2007. He has a, bachelor a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the Colorado School of Mines and completed medical school at the University of Iowa. His postgraduate training includes pediatrics at the University of Utah and child neurology at the University of Washington and clinical neurophysiology at Nicklaus Children's Hospital. Please welcome Dr. Ian Miller. Great, thank you for that warm introduction. Um, I am gonna try to hit the highlights of genetic testing in epilepsy and help our um, constituents understand the role that genetic testing has and how it can benefit you. So if you can go to the next slide, please. The first thing to understand is that there's been a large change in how epilepsy is conceived of. And I think if you're lucky in the 1990s uh, and even up to um, you know, 2010 probably, the best we could do in terms of why you have epilepsy is identifying whether there was something obvious like a trauma, a vascular injury, a neoplasm, a history of infection, something like that. But there's this big group, this three quarter of the pie chart, which was idiopathic, which means the cause is unknown. And over time, we have gotten to the point where we're identifying individual genes. Um, we're going to uh, single gene epilepsies, um, epilepsies with complicated forms of inheritance, as well as um, epilepsies that have modifiers and susceptibility genes. And if you can go to the next slide. In 2020, we're essentially to the point, oops, can you go back one? Thanks. Uh, we're to the point where that three quarters of the pie chart can actually be broken down very, very finely. And the point of that pie chart is not to name every slice, it's to recognize that each individual slice is very, very teeny tiny. And there are actually thousands of slices if you could zoom in enough to see all the detail. So in that idiopathic epilepsy segment, we're finally to the point where we can understand what that's made up of and what the individual ideologies are. The ideology is the cause, and that's the goal with genetic testing. Next slide. This slide really is simply to communicate how quickly progress is being made. It took about uh, 20 years for the first handful of genes to be discovered, and since that time, it's only uh, gone vertically. Um, there are approximately 30,000 genes in the human DNA blueprint and approximately 2,200 or so can cause epilepsy. And at this point, it's likely that we've identified, uh, you know, the lion's share of which genes are which, at least 90%, probably higher than 95%. But it's accelerating very quickly. And because of how fast this is improving, it makes sense to revisit this if this is something that you considered with your doctors a long time ago, and maybe haven't looked at it in a while. Next slide. So the question is who deserves testing? Next slide. And the answer is that really everybody deserves testing. I'm a pediatric neurologist, so that's the focus of a lot of my data and slides. But this makes the point that it doesn't matter if your epilepsy started when you were a teenager. Um, there can actually be an identified genetic cause even when you have epilepsy presenting at 15 years age, of age, which is a second uh, peak for identifiable causes, or even later. You can see, uh, you know, 23, 36, 47 years of age that actually has an identifiable cause. So I don't think it ever makes sense to give up completely. And I would say that any person with a single seizure in their life deserves genetic testing. Next slide. Um, the point of this is that testing is available and you can advance through these until all the bullets are there. The um, reality is that there is a set of tests or, or a panel that is made available to individuals with epilepsy that are under age eight. So that's not helpful for a lot of the adults in the audience, but um, if you have a child that has epilepsy and is not yet uh, eight years of age, Behind the Seizure offers free testing for children who have had a single seizure. And commercial testing coverage is also quite good. So if you're not lucky enough to be eight years old and have your entire life in front of you and be very young, uh, you might be able to get insurance coverage for genetic testing. And luckily, even Medicaid, which historically has had terrible coverage for a lot of stuff that our patients need, is getting better. Next slide. So let's discuss briefly why we want to test. We touched on this a little bit earlier. But the benefits to gene testing include 
the ability to impact clinical management. I saw some questions about how do I choose a medicine and how long do I stay on it and how do I know if it's working. Genetic testing really can help you make an informed decision about what medicines are likely to work. It doesn't mean you have a guarantee, but it definitely helps you prioritize which ones are the highest yield and make sense to try first. It can also help you understand where things like ketogenic diet might be really, really important to you, whereas it's just kind of a middle of the road option for another person with a different form of genetic epilepsy. It may help you avoid unnecessary testing, such as recurrent MRIs or uh, metabolic testing or biopsies. It can shorten the diagnostic journey for many families. It allows specific genetic counseling regarding recurrence in blood relatives and family counseling. It might allow you to participate in a clinical trial uh, at Nicholas Children's Hospital. We just treated our first child with gene therapy for genetic epilepsy about two months ago, and so far she's doing very well, and we're excited about the coming wave of genetic therapies because these are going to become bigger and bigger over time. And uh, you know, we want to have your diagnosis made so that we can treat you that way in the future should the opportunity arise. It does allow for targeted therapy, like we said, and it connects families with each other and advocacy groups. As excellent as Epilepsy Florida is, it is only one organization, and you can get even more understanding and expertise from other um, more specific disease groups that might deal with one specific gene, for example. Next slide. Um, this kind of speaks to the strategy and the route that your doctor might take. Historically, we've done a lot of blood tests to look at different forms of metabolic testing, et cetera, before we go to an epilepsy panel. But the point of this is that the epilepsy panel is so high yield, it actually makes sense to go to first. Next slide. This gives you the idea of which genes are responsible for the identifiable forms of genetic epilepsy that we have. The first approximately 10 genes are colored in purple, I guess 11, and those 11 genes have more than 10 patients each, whereas everything to the right of that only has uh, about six or fewer individuals, and that long tail goes on and on. So it makes sense to test the most likely genes first, and that's where the initial panel makes sense. This diagram was made with the original panel that had 56 genes in it, but I just was informed yesterday that the behind the seizure panel actually increased to 308 genes, and again, that's free for kids under eight years of age. So the testing just gets better and better. It becomes more and more affordable and easier and easier to obtain from insurance. And so it absolutely has to be considered if you haven't had it done already. Next slide. Um, this talks about the idea that multiple epilepsies um, in kind of the old fashioned term are actually um, caused by different genes. So what we used to call benign familial neonatal epilepsy are actually caused by two different genes. One's a potassium channel two and one's a potassium channel three. And those might have similar treatments and they might have different treatments. And that's why it's important to understand. It's also possible for potassium channel two and potassium channel three to cause different uh, syndromic epilepsies. So more and more, the real answer to what kind of epilepsy do I have is not you know, childhood absence epilepsy or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome or complex partial epilepsy. It is a specific gene which is causing your specific epilepsy and that fully informs your doctor about why you have it, where it came from, what the prognostic implications are, and what it means for your family and blood relatives. Next slide. Um, next slide. So this is an example of a child who had epilepsy, normal function initially at age six months, but then uh, became slow to walk and had a gross motor delay observed at 17 months. It wasn't until 25 months that they had their first seizure and was on multiple therapeutic trials of medications, including lamotrigine, ethosuximide, um, some form of medical marijuana, and had breakthrough seizures in spite of multiple AEDs. It wasn't until um, four years of age that the diagnosis of GLUT1 deficiency was made. Uh, GLUT1 deficiency occurs when the brain is unable to move glucose into the, um, to the brain itself across the blood-brain barrier. And by putting a child on a ketogenic diet, you can dramatically change the nature of their epilepsy and the burden of their seizures. The child was placed on the ketogenic diet and did much better. So that's a concrete example of where it can be helpful. Next slide. And we can skip this case. I think uh, in the interest of time, it makes sense to keep going. So let's talk briefly about how to test. Next slide. There are multiple levels of sophistication 
and detail, basically. It's how close you are to the ground when you're looking for individual problems. And if you're looking from far, far away at a high level, like kind of looking at the map of Earth from outer space, that's a low resolution type of picture that you're getting uh, with minimal detail, but you're able to see big changes. And that uh, can be done with a chromosomal micro microarray. A gene panel, which is kind of what I've been focusing on, is kind of an intermediate level of testing. But in 2020, we can actually get whole exome or even whole genome sequencing, which looks at the entire DNA blueprint from start to finish in kind of uh, a very, very comprehensive, but necessarily less deep way. So those are the kinds of decisions that your doctor will help you with in terms of knowing what kind of genetic testing to obtain. But in my opinion, at a minimum, every person who's had at least one seizure deserves the microarray as well as a genetic epilepsy panel. Next slide. The diagnostic yields, when these are used the way that I'm referring to, are quite good. The epilepsy panel can find the cause of the epilepsy in approximately 27.2% of patients and the microarray in approximately 17% of patients. And if anything, these numbers are underestimates now because they're about uh, three years old. The whole exome sequencing has a higher hit rate, as you would expect, because it's looking at a wider array and a bigger swath of the DNA blueprint, and it uncovers the cause of the epilepsy in approximately 33% of patients. Next slide. The paradigms in genetic testing are evolving. In the old days, doctors had a lot of objections, and I think all of those objections essentially have been answered as time has gone by because the testing is getting better. Next. One issue that does come up quite frequently, no matter who your doctor is, is the question of interpretation. Uh, it's totally possible for this test to come back with a clue, and it's uncertain to your doctor and to you whether that clue is important or unimportant, because there's lots of unimportant clues on the DNA testing. Um, the nature of the clue and what it means is really interpreted using the type of pattern that that gene is known to possess, because at this point, most genes have a known pattern of inheritance, and that pattern can be autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or X-linked. And the details aren't super important, except to note that they all have their own rules that they follow, and your doctor will be considering these things in terms of understanding what it means. Next. This is one example of what a DNA test looks like. Uh, this was performed for a single gene, actually, and so uh, the current panels might have a listing of 308 genes, for example, but this tells us that there is actually a variant in the TSC1 gene, it says TSC1 variant 1, you know, transition, blah, 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 and it says TSC2, transition, blah, 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 so it helps us get a sense of um, whether there's a change in the DNA blueprint that has not been seen before, and if so, how likely that change is to have caused a problem. Um, because we're all unique individuals, we're not identical twins with any, anyone else in the world, there has to be some unique constituents in our DNA blueprint uh, for all of us. And the fact that we find something unique is not that remarkable. It is only remarkable if it is a unique change in our DNA blueprint, which will break the way that that blueprint works when we actually um, copy and create in our bodies what that blueprint describes. Next slide. And next slide. One clue that your doctor will use to interpret whether the change is innocent or problem causing is to look at the chemistry of the amino acid change, which is present. The DNA blueprint really is a set of instructions to your body to make a string out of amino acids. It's kind of like taking Legos out of your Lego box and putting them in a row. And when you put those Legos in the right arrangement, they will magically fold themselves up into the right shape in a three-dimensional way and perform a function or a job. Because there's a finite number of options, and because that blueprint describes how the Legos are to be put together, a mutation in the DNA, which can cause epilepsy, is simply having the wrong Lego come next in the sequence. You might have a single Lego out of order, you might have several Legos out of order, you might actually end the Lego structure at a certain point. And by looking at the general patterns of amino acid chemistry in this diagram um, from Wikipedia, you know, they divide up the four kind of fundamental types of chemistry that amino acids have. You can get some gauge in terms of how disruptive uh, one amino acid is for another. So two of the amino acids in the, in the yellow section of this graph um, might be less disruptive than a purple amino acid substituted for a yellow amino acid, for example. Next slide. One issue which will always limit our ability to interpret the testing is the idea that a single human being actually may have the mutation in only some of their cells. And 
This is mainly a consideration for autosomal dominant inheritance, but it does markedly limit our ability to make absolute statements regarding whether a specific genetic cause is present or not, because if it can be present in some cells but not others, it's possible, possible that we tested some cells in which it's absent, but it's present in your brain, which we can't directly test with our, you know, getting a specimen from your body, and therefore we're, we'll never be able to document that it's there because those cells are essentially out of reach of our laboratory tools. So this isn't super important to understand, except to realize that it does exist and that this is something that your doctor absolutely has to take into account as they interpret what they're telling you and what it means, and also that it's unavoidable to some degree um, in terms of the limitations that it puts on what we know. Next slide. Um, this kind of shows how a mosaic system can happen. We all start with a single fertilized egg, and as that egg divides, we become bigger and bigger, and eventually our bodies are billions of cells big. Mosaicism is the idea that at any point in this cell division, the mutation can occur. And it, once it occurs, everything downstream will be affected, nothing upstream will be affected, and that's how one person can have actually two different DNA blueprints, one that is kind of quote unquote normal, and one that is normal except for a single point mutation, which could conceivably cause epilepsy if those cells are actually in the brain. Next slide. Um, this is a little bit of detail regarding how often those types of mistakes happen and I don't think is particularly germane to our conversation today. We can skip it. Next slide. So I think there are a few practical tips related to genetic epilepsy and testing. Um, if you have an answer already and you know your gene, so to speak, congratulations. I think you and your medical team have done an awesome job thinking as deeply as we can to get answers for you. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be super happy with your seizure freedom or your epilepsy control because epilepsy is just a brutal disease at times. But I think you've really done as much work as can possibly be done in the direction of diagnosis. If you haven't been tested, on the other hand, you should definitely tell your doctor that you want testing. If cost or, in, or insurance is brought up as a hurdle, uh, first, you should fight it and advocate for yourself and um, you know, essentially insist that it be done and advocate maximally with your insurance company. Sometimes that's fruitful, often it's not. But if your child is less than eight years old, you should definitely mention behind the seizure specifically because again, that testing is free and it's free without restriction as long as they've had a single unprovoked seizure or more and they're under eight. Um, if it's been a long time, since you had testing, you know, you had it and it was negative and you don't have an answer because it was uh, unrevealing. If it's been more than two years or so since that time, you should definitely consider reassessing what facts you have because it's possible that our understanding of genetics has improved and there might be more to test. And it's possible that those same clues that we had might be more cleanly or fully interpretable with information that have occurred in the uh, intervening period. If you are tested with unclear results, ask for a consultation with neurogenetics. So this really relates to a person who's had a gene that was a variant of unknown significance or was of unknown meaning or uncertain causality with the epilepsy. And if that happens, it's totally understandable and your doctor isn't um, you know, unqualified or ignorant because they don't know what happens. That happens to everybody, even the person who's most expert in genetic epilepsy. But it does probably make sense to ask to speak with a neurogeneticist who can help maximally interpret what we know out of the tools and clues that we have. Next slide. So in conclusion, every individual with an unprovoked seizure should have an epilepsy sequencing panel and a microarray, even if specific findings are absent. Um, Oh, no, excuse me, even, it, it should say, uh, unless specific findings are uh, absent. My point here is that if you have a known brain tumor, if you have a known stroke, if you have a known infection, that kind of falls in the upper left quadrant of that original pie chart that we looked at. And if there's a really clear cut etiology, then in that case, epilepsy sequencing and microarray might not make sense. But if it is idiopathic and there is no good reason why you have it, which again, based on that original pie chart is probably three quarters of individuals with epilepsy, you should have genetic testing as outlined here. The diagnostic, diagnostic approach is not only the most comprehensive, but it's probably the most efficient, meaning the cheapest for your insurance carrier. And um, it also saves another medical testing and hospitalization. So in the end, it becomes cheaper for them. Interpretation definitely can be challenging, but your doctor has resources available to them if they are willing to refer you outside. And identifying the etiology guides treatment, it guides prognosis, it guides recurrence risk and blood relatives. So it is absolutely worth the effort. Next slide. That's it. I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions if folks have them.
Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. And we do have a couple of questions. Two of them sort of piggyback on each other. So there's one question stating, if the child does have a genetic mutation, um, should the parents be tested? And that goes with the question of how far back does the genetic testing go and how is it relevant to the child's evolution? Yeah, so those are two different questions and related, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is that yes, uh, when a variant is found, it is usually important and helpful to test the parents. Um, this is especially the case if the mutation or the gene is autosomal dominant. Autosomal dominant means that a single copy is enough to cause epilepsy. In that case, probably the child has epilepsy and the parents don't because if the parents had epilepsy, it'd be less of a mystery about what's happening and why, and you might have an answer already. But in the case that the child has it, the parents don't, and it is, it's an autosomal dominant gene, the overwhelming likelihood is that it's a new mutation that happened in the generations between the parent and the child. If that is the case, what we wanna know is whether the mutation happened on the parent side, meaning prior to the generation of that individual sperm or egg cell, or on the child side, which is after the um, combination of the sperm and egg cell, meaning the fertilized egg. If it happened after the egg was fertilized, then there's no way that that genetic mistake can be passed on to other children. If it happened on the upstream side, however, there obviously is a risk, and that risk probably is close to 50%. So it's really important to know which side of that divide you fall on. Because of the possibility of mosaicism, which we touched on, that was the idea that you can't ever know every cell without dissolving an entire human being in a tube and sending your entire body to the lab, which doesn't do us any good. Um, we can't ever know for sure. But we want to get at that as much as we can. And when there is uncertainty, we want to recognize that that uncertainty exists and how it affects your risks of recurrence. So um, I hope that answers your question in terms of parent testing in general. Yes, it's uh, very important, although with some conditions, especially autosomal recessive things, that might not be necessary. Does that answer both questions, Mary? I think, I think that it does. I think that part of the question was, um, aside from the parents, do grandparents have to be tested? How far back does it go? Yeah. Or does so, it really matter? Yeah, it, it can matter and it depends on the circumstances. Um, there are definitely cases where I have strongly recommended grandparent testing to be done. And that's usually the case when we're not sure whether an autosomal dominant gene is causing the epilepsy. So we test the parents and the parent has it too. That actually creates confusion um, because you would think that if the parent has it and the parent is asymptomatic, then there can't be a cause and effect between the gene because the parent has it, they're asymptomatic and the child has it and is symptomatic, but apparently that's a coincidence. The problem is again, mosaicism. So I'm glad I left that slide in because we've touched on it a couple of times. Um, the problem in that situation is that the parent might be mosaic. We might have found it in the cells of the mom or the dad, whichever, um, it doesn't matter, so just ignore one of them, uh, that we sent to the lab, but their brain is unaffected by it because of mosaicism. By testing the parents of the parent, so the grandparents, that essentially is one strategy to exclude mosaicism or, or to rule it in, because if the grandparents don't have it, and those grandparents are the biological parents of the mom or the dad, that's also uh, one issue that is sometimes touchy or that you don't know for sure. Um, but as long as those are the biological grandparents, if either one of them has it, then the parent can't be a mosaic anymore because the way mosaicism works based on the way that we kind of looked at that tree unfolding, you can only have mosaicism in one place. And if you have it in the grandparent, you can't have it in a parent. And, and essentially, an affected, an individual with any affected cells can't pass on mosaicism. Once you've found it in any cells in a, in a person, that person might be mosaic, but nobody downstream from them possibly can be. That's the crux of the matter. So grandparent testing can be important when you're looking at and trying to understand whether there is mosaicism in the parents. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. I have one more question and, and then we'll move on. Um, I have a question regarding life expectancy. Um, does epilepsy affect life expectancy? Yeah, that's a really heavy question, and it totally depends on the cause of epilepsy. And that's one of the 
the reasons why genetic testing is so important. That second case that we skipped past was actually a form of progressive epilepsy. And um, children with that form of epilepsy have a degenerative course. Their uh, development is normal early on, and they actually degenerate and lose the ability to walk and talk and uh, die from their epilepsy. Um, those children have access to a treatment which can actually replace the enzyme and arrest the disease where it is. But if that child does not get diagnosed, it can be fatal. So that's the most extreme example of life-threatening epilepsy. It's degenerative and it um, is lethal within uh, months. Um, but most epilepsy, I think, I would say is not life-threatening, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that the same way that I would say that, um, you know, driving to Miami from, you know, uh, Orlando is not life-threatening. There are exceptions. Um, SUDEP is something that is, uh, you know, lives on the back of our minds all the time and really bothers us when we stop and think about it. But I think the same way that you don't stop and think about mortality when you're making the drive from Orlando to Miami, it kind of doesn't make your life better to worry about mortality with SUDEP on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I think it is important for sure that we recognize that it's real and when it happens, it's just the worst thing on earth. Um, but I think it's also important um, not to let it control our lives. You know, I think um, a couple of years ago, we had an Epilepsy Florida um, discussion with Kurt Eichenwald with his, uh, um, with his book and his point that he made, which I thought was really profound was that he didn't beat epilepsy by becoming seizure free. He beat epilepsy by stopping it from controlling his life. And, um, you know, that's our goal with, um, maximal treatment and, um, you know, kind of pragmatism and um, honesty about where we are and what the future holds. I have one more question. This will be my last, I promise. Um, what about, uh, the variant of unknown significance? Yeah, those are definitely, the fly and the ointment of useful answers, because it basically means we found something and we don't know what it means. I would argue that if you found something and you don't know what it means, you're still ahead of the game and that that's better than having no idea about anything. Um, and over time, we are increasingly capable of interpreting those variants. And that diagram that I showed you is one way, looking at where it is in the gene and how critical that region is. Because if you have something in the in the business part of the protein that's made, that's going to be more sensitive to a change than something that's kind of like, um, you know, uh, off on some uh, vestigial component of the protein. So it's hard. It's sometimes insurmountable and can't be resolved with the technology that we have at any given time, but it's also something that can be revisited continuously. And um, it's highly likely, I think, that in the long run, we will be able to ascertain what all these mean and interpret what they mean for the individuals that are affected by them. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. We appreciate yeah, all of the information. Thank you.